So I talked about in class just how Jay's treaty, which really resulted from the tension between the British and the French. So the British and French are fighting and the Americans really don't like the way the British are impressing them and have got, you know, troops and, um, you know, forts out west where they're inciting the Indians. So John Jay gets sent to England basically to try to, you know, get the impressment to stop, to get some money back from the ships that have been, you know, taken, um, to get them to stop inciting Native Americans and leave their forts and try to get a better sort of commercial treaty. And in the end, the better commercial treaty comes, but all that, you know, the America wanted to be stopped, namely the troops inciting the Indians and the impressment didn't stop. So uh, George Washington and this new country looked really, really weak. They looked like they uh, had gone to England, uh, you know, through John Jay and just basically kissed the ring. And people around the world uh, thought, there they are getting back in bed with the English. Now, the reality is, is that, uh, you know, just like the colonies had very little leverage back when they were colonies, um, at least they may have had some leverage relative to mercantilism. America had very, very little leverage overall. Um, but sort of this this loss, if you will, even though technically there was sort of a slightly better commercial treaty, hurt Washington's prestige. Um, you know, this is considered the low point of Washington's presidency. But on top of that, the perception for the French is, oh, look, it looks like the Americans and the British are getting back together. So it turned out to be a lose-lose. America didn't get what it wanted. And at the same time, France is now even more angered. So you look at this as sort of a, a, a diplomatic problem. Now, there's one silver lining. It's very, very weird. Just as the French perceived that, um, you know, the British and the Americans were somehow getting back together, the Spanish looked at this and they're like, oh, wait, if they are actually getting back together, it could hurt all of our holdings in North America. So there've been some ongoing negotiations between United States and Spain that have gone on for a while. And finally, Spain's like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll help you out. Like, we don't want to anger you. So there is Pickney's Treaty that basically is pretty important overall in terms of Americans being able to send their goods all the way down the Mississippi to New Orleans. That's really, really important. It'll come up in uh, the Louisiana Purchase, sort of the, the neprechauns for that. Also, it's going to sort of change the Florida boundary a lot, and it's going to try to limit... Native Americans from going into from Spanish Florida into the United States. But really the important part is being able to, to take goods all the way down the Mississippi from up in like the Pacific, in the Pacific sorry, the old Northwest uh, where sort of Illinois is located all the way down uh, to the Gulf of Mexico. Now, the election of 1796 is an important one because um, Washington could have run for third term, fourth term, fifth term. There's nothing in the Constitution at that point that said that you couldn't do that. It's not going to be until FDR that that actually there's a constitutional amendment. But Washington said, listen, it's time for me to go. Uh, it's time for me to retire back to Virginia. And so his farewell address is actually not an address like a speech. It's actually a long letter and it's written mostly by Hamilton and it's printed up in newspapers. And what it really is, is it's, it's an attack on what has happened within his presidency and the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans going at it. So he basically warns against what is known as the insidious wiles of foreign influence. Now, he's basically saying, don't get yourself permanently entangled with another country like the United States have been with France. Washington obviously benefited greatly from this treaty between France and the United States that Benjamin Franklin negotiated after the Battle of Saratoga. It helped him win the war ultimately. Uh, against the British, but he's looking around going, man, because technically on paper, we're still in bed with the French, this is making it really hard for us to be neutral. So he doesn't say don't ally with countries in a war. He basically says, don't get yourself in these long entangling alliances that you can't get out of. So the United States is actually going to stay out of entangling alliances until 1949. My gosh, that's so far. It's, uh, you know, 150 years uh, later um, with when it enters what's known as NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. He also basically says like political parties are bad. <laughs> well, by that point, his entire administration has been basically rife with, you know, Federalists and Democratic Republicans fighting. Um, so this we say the horse was out of the barn, but he was certainly critical of that. Now, once Washington is gone again, Washington was the great hero. The hero of the revolution helped um, usher the Constitution through as the head of the Constitutional Convention, these tensions that have been sort of building 
sort of once that you know top was off the pot, everything just boiled over. Even though it had certainly been been getting hotter while he was president, it sort of all came out. So Jefferson now is going to be the Republican candidate. It's weird because he had actually left being the Secretary of State because he didn't like the disagreements over the French Rev and the United States declared neutrality instead of helping the French. Um, and then the, it's like, who's going to be the Federalist to go up against Jefferson? Well, Hamilton just is a genius, but too many people dislike him. And so John Adams, who'd been vice president, he gets the nod. People don't necessarily love him. They think he's sort of an intellectual snob. He's very sort of supercilious, but they say, you know, he's the best we got. Okay. Now the election of 1796 really is the first election in which there are two competing parties. And again, when Washington ran the first time and even the second time, he pretty much runs unopposed. Now, Adams defeats Jefferson just barely, but because they've got this weird system, it's like whoever gets second becomes the vice president. Jefferson from an opposing party becomes the vice president to Adams. So it's weird. You got a Federalist president, a Democratic Republican vice president. It's very weird. That's going to ultimately change with the 12th Amendment. Now, Adams is actually the president, but within his own party, Hamilton's doing things to sort of undermine him. So he's sort of a divided party, whereas the Republicans seem to be picking up momentum and steam, okay? Now, you have to understand this piece. It's, it's a little hard to understand, but, but I need you to, to really focus here because it can help you answer that second thesis boot camp question. So technically speaking, American relations with Britain get better. Yeah, I mean, they didn't get the, you know, the Native Americans to stop being incited by British troops and they still had impressment going on, but there seemed to be sort of more cordial relations with Britain. And then Spain, because they misread this sort of situation and they want to give us stuff. But the situation with France still remains really, really poor. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, just as Washington sent Jay to Britain to try to get impressment to stop, Adams is going to try to send his people to France to try to get them to stop impressing. And sort of in a big picture, what happens is the French are like, no, we're not even going to really meet with you. And then people within the Adams administration are like, we want war. So at that point, Adams is like, OK, like I'm going to send an even more sort of established group to go negotiate with France. Like we got to solve this once and for all. And he sends a, a really sort of high powered group, Pickney, who negotiated Pickney's treaty. Uh, Elbridge Gerry, who, who gerrymandering, I know it's not even said this the same way, uh, is going to go. And then John Marshall, who uh, originally had been rejected and later become the first sort of great Supreme Court justice. So please follow this logic. It's very, very important to understand. It's all cause and effect. So the capture of American ships, again, just the French are impressing just like the British are, led to American anger at the French, okay, which led to this need to negotiate. Okay, we, we've gotten it. We had that on the last slide. But once Pickney and Marshall, uh, oh boy, and, and Gary get there, they're told by the French, you can't even talk to our guy Talleyrand unless you pay a quarter of a million dollars, basically a bribe. Now, technically, sort of as the way diplomacy worked at that point, that's sort of par for the course. But Americans are like, we will not pay any tribute at all to speak to your leader, which is completely ironic because they were paying tribute to basically um, Tripolitan North African pirates to, to not take their ships out of the Mediterranean. But whatever, that's another story. They basically said, we will not pay you any money. And then they sort of went off in a huff. And so this leads to this very anti-French sentiment in America from the Federalists. They're like, we went over there to negotiate and they wouldn't even see us. So they're awful people. We're mad at them. So you got to think about this. The people in America that support the French are the Democratic Republicans, Jefferson's people. So it's like, if we're mad at the French, we're also mad at the Democratic Republicans. And we can use that anti-French, anti-Democratic Republican sort of momentum and spirit to go after our political enemies. Okay, here it is. This is uh, Gary and Marshall and Pickney sort of meeting this three-headed monster, weird looking thing. Uh, of the French known as X, Y, and Z. So again, they didn't even name who those people were. They just referred to them as X, Y, Z. Uh, and that's why it's known as the X, Y, Z affair. Now, I'm not going to get a chance to show this, but I, I do love it. It is the X, Y, Z affair as described by this 
history teacher who also sings songs. Okay, skip this. Okay, now keep going. So as a result of this X Y Z affair, where they demanded money, and then the you know the Federalists are like, how dare they French? How dare they Democratic Republicans? They passed two laws that really went hard after the Democratic Republicans. The Alien Acts, which really are anti-immigrant acts, the first sort of anti-immigrant acts in American history, they make it harder to become a citizen. So instead of five years that you're an immigrant here before you become a citizen, 14 years. Now, it's important to remember that the party that sort of had immigrant support was the Democratic Republicans. So this was a way to really go after those people who politically supported the Democratic Republicans. It's like, we will take out your sort of political legs. And they also made it easier for immigrants to be removed. So again, it's very anti-immigrant. Now, the Sedition Act is even more sort of it just explicitly anti-democratic Republican. It's like you can't criticize in print or, you know, orally the government in power. It, it goes blatantly against the First Amendment. Um, but the First Amendment wouldn't really matter because pretty much all the people on the Supreme Court at the time were Federalists. So you have these two laws, one that sort of indirectly goes after the Democratic Republicans because of their political base, but also one that just says you can't criticize the government. Now, the Democratic Republicans look at this and they're just like, are you, are you kidding me? Like, what's going on here? Like, I thought we, you know, we're, we're you know, two political parties, but you can't just stick it to us like this. So Madison and Jefferson, the Democratic Republican godfathers, if you will, they try to pass laws that say, the Alien and Sedition Acts are unconstitutional. They're known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Virginia, which was written by Madison, and Kentucky, which was written by Jefferson. Now, this idea is so, so, so crucial. They argue that states can declare laws unconstitutional. So if a law is passed by Congress in Washington, D.C., the individual states could declare them unconstitutional. Their legal logic said, the states existed prior to the Constitution. That's true. We had the Articles of Confederation before we had the Constitution. There was a country before there was a Constitution. And they said, you have to understand that the Constitution was created as a compact of the states. We came together to create it, and then you had to have nine out of 13 ratify it. It was actually created by the states. It didn't create the states. It was created by the states. Therefore, if a law is passed by the Congress that we created in the Constitution, we, the ones who created Congress, essentially can nullify it. We can say that it, it's not um, legally valid in our state. Now, it's important to know that they advanced this thing called compact theory or even contract theory. Sometimes it's just known because either the Constitution is known as sort of a contract between the states or a compact between the states. They didn't get it eliminated. The Virginia and Kentucky resolutions were not eliminated. No one sort of bought this legal argument. No other states wrote resolutions about it. And so what's interesting here is this idea of compact theory that says states can nullify laws. And if no one, you know, listens to them, that they could even secede. OK, but the idea of state nullification will have great influence later on, certainly in the 1800s, as we go towards the Civil War. So this idea of compact theory as a principle, dies, sort of in the moment, but it also lives on in later events, okay? So we're going to see this again in the future. Where will we see this again in the future? Certainly in something known as um, the nullification crisis with South Carolina, and certainly with South Carolina again as we go towards the Civil War. Now, it is interesting to know that the quasi-war with France continued. Like, it's an unofficial war where America seems to be fighting France and actually, the Department of the Navy is created by Adams. He's known as the father of the Navy. And they actually have new warships built. But the irony is, is that Adams, quote unquote, got the country dressed up for war and never took them to war. And as a result, sort of everybody was pissed off. Like, you know what? If you're getting threatened like that, you got to fight them, particularly the Federalists who are like, you know what? We're anti-France, so we, we should take it to France. And finally, in the end... Um, sort of right as he's leaving office, Adams is going to be defeated in the election of 1800. So right before that, he actually signs a deal uh, with Napoleon called the Convention of 1800. It's basically like, whoa, you guys were great to help us 22 years ago, but we got to be done with this. So we're actually fully, fully out of bed with them in what's known as the Convention of 1800. Now, the election of 1800 is a super important election because the president is running against the vice president, okay, the Federalist Adams against the Democratic Republican Jefferson. 
it is brutal in terms of negative campaigning. We call mud slinging. Um, you know, the Democratic Republicans called Adams an aristocrat and an elitist, a monar- monarchist. And, um, you know, the Federalists pointed out that Thomas Jefferson likely had children with his slave, which was true. Uh, Sally Hemings. Now, in the end, though, it's the first peaceful transition of power. So we went from having Federalists. Washington wasn't technically a Federalist. But he had Federalist sort of leanings. If you cut him open, you see he had Federalist blood in him. And then Adams, of course, was an out-and-out Federalist. Well, now you're going to go from one party to another. In most countries, when you had this transition of power from one to another, there was bloodshed. Um, this was pretty remarkable. In addition, the Southerners are going to gain power. You know, now it's going to move. The sort of fulcrum of power is going to move from the Northeast. Sort of, you know, again, I know it seemed like, you know, Washington was a federalist and he was from Virginia, but really between sort of Hamilton's New York and Adams, you know, Massachusetts, it was up there in the Northeast. Now it's going to go down to the South. So that's very important for slavery uh, in terms of having presidents who are slave owners uh, and really sort of represent the South. Whereas Washington, while a slave owner, wasn't as Southern as everybody else. So we're going to go Jefferson and then we're going to go Madison and then we're going to go Monroe, all two-term presidents, slave owners. Now, Jefferson said, like, the election of 1800 is the revolution of 1800. We're bringing the power back to the people like we did in 1776. This is we knocked down a tyrant in King George, you know, in 1776, and we fought. Now we're knocking down, you know, a a king in the Federalists. Well, we'll see. We'll see how much he really does sort of bring it all back to the original spirit or how much he ends up keeping. All right. So that was the end of my chapter 8A notes.